All right, all right. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> I'm going to pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, and, and just the challenge of just preparing a sermon, Lord, and trying to deliver a message, dear Lord, God. I pray that uh, you would help me to just um, preach with boldness and clarity of mind, dear Lord, and I pray that you would uh, bless me, Lord, in preaching and bless the hearers, Lord, and that I pray that all things uh, said and done here tonight would glorify and honor you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted, accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things approving ourselves, as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. What I want to preach about today is balance in the Christian life. Now I have a question. A lot of people talk about balance as a Christian, and, and I'm going to get to what I ultimately believe that that really is referring to, coming from a saved brother or coming from somebody who's trying to serve Christ with their life. But let me ask you this. If you think about a great Christian in the Bible, a great one, just name your top five. Name your top three. Did they live lives of just luxury and just they had everything, they had an abundance they had the car they wanted, they had the job they wanted, they had a white picket fence in the yard, you know, the kids are stinking running through the fall leaves. I mean, is this the picture you get from the great men of God in, in the Bible? It's not, man. And I just want to talk about balance as a Christian and what the Bible actually teaches balance as a Christian. So here you have a picture, kind of a synopsis, a synopsis of, of Paul's life. And you think about all these things that he talks about, these are all things that Paul went through. And, um, you know, for thousands of years, Christians have talked about balance in the Christian life. Now, if you go to a typical Baptist church and you talk about balance, they're not thinking like serving God balance. They're thinking about, you know, having this spiritual lifestyle, lifestyle evangelism, maybe reading a passage every now and then. You know, they probably have, you know, three or four verses memorized, but their family life is great. They're thinking super successful at their job. You know, when you ask them and they think they're balanced, right? But that's not the Bible. That's not the balance the Bible teaches. Um, so I want to notice in verse 4, Paul says this, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience and afflictions and necessities and distresses and distresses and stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labors and watchings and fastings. Now, notice in verse 5, he says, in stripes and imprisonments and tumults. And then he says, in labors and watchings and fasting. So the first three, it's all just suffering. First three are all suffering. You know what the next three are? It's labor. It's watchings. It's fastings. That is the Christian life right there, man. There's suffering and then there's labor in a, in a biblical Christian life. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4 real quick. Keep your finger in 2 Corinthians 6. 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm going to read about four verses in here, I believe. 1 Peter 4, we're going to start in verse number 1. It says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For thee that has suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin. So think about this. Christ wasn't above suffering. So why would some Christian, you know, some typical sinful Christian, why would he be above suffering? You know, but Christians don't want anything to do with suffering. When they suffer, they think they're doing something wrong. Let me just step back away from that. I must be doing too much, you know. But then he says, arm yourselves 
likewise with the same mind. What's he saying? You should expect these things. It's not going to be easy. What's he saying? It's going to be hard. Arm yourself. Now, jump down to verse 12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with all. Uh, glad also with exceeding joy. So he says, when you suffer, rejoice. Now, I'm going to read to you real quick 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's a very famous passage. But I want you to think about this. You see Christ suffered and he says to arm yourselves. You see in, in 2 Corinthians 5 or 2 Corinthians 6, he talks about suffering and he talks about laboring. Now, who thinks Paul was a good Christian? He's a great Christian. Probably the best Christian in the, in, in the New Testament, right? You know, how did Paul's life go? Did he have a you know, happy family? You say Paul wasn't married, but still, did he suffer? Did he suffer greatly? Did he work real hard? Does anybody here work that hard? No, but would you say Paul was a good Christian or an unbalanced Christian? I mean, talk about a perfect balance. You think Christ was balanced or unbalanced? How much did Christ do? They thought he was beside himself. You know what I mean? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, think about what this verse says. It says, therefore, my beloved brother, famous passage, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that, the la that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So he says, be steadfast, unmovable. And he says, always abounding. Those are powerful words, man. He says, you know, I mean, he's using strong language there. And he says, the work of the Lord. And he says, as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then another passage just to kind of uh, just put on top of this. 1 Corinthians 3, 5, Paul says this. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. So you know the Christian doesn't do any work? There's people that don't have a minister. That's just what the Bible teaches, man. Now, you know, a lot of people, you do, I mean, this is just, here's, this is the, this is the woe that Brother Josh was talking about. What about all the people? Now, we'll probably never all reach the people that God has ordained for us to go out and reach, to preach the gospel to. But man, try to put a dent in it. You know what I mean? I mean, try to get something done. So my first point is the Christian life is full of suffering if you're doing it right. It's not full of suffering if you're not doing it right. If you're not doing it right, the Christian life can look just like the world, man. Go with me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And then put your finger in Acts chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and look at verse 5 again. And we're going to go through verse 7. It says, In stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labors and watchings and fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, he says this, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. So I want you to notice that it says in verse 5, it goes on, we already mentioned the stripes and imprisonments, and he says in verse 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God. What is our power? I mean, are we battling against carnal things or are we battling against spiritual things? Our strength is in God's word. Go to Acts chapter 5. Now, Acts, the book of Acts, if you want to look at a bunch of great Christians doing a lot of good work for God, I mean, if you want to look at Christians, for the most part, big picture, fulfilling God's will as a Christian, go to the book of Acts right. and just read, man. Acts chapter 5, verse number 40. Tell me if this sounds balanced in your typical Baptist church. Tell me if you're going to find this in San Jose Baptist Church. Just let me know. Verse 40, or verse... Uh, where am I? Acts chapter 5, verse number 40. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. What's the typical Christian going to do? Yes, sir. You ain't going to have no problems with me. Let's see what they did. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. Isn't that what it said in that passage we just read? They were beaten, and they left rejoicing. Don't read over that. Don't just act like, oh, that's just what the Bible says. God doesn't really expect that from you. This is a godly attitude. That's really, I mean, honestly. It says, and they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer. Dude, counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Do they get the glory? Nope. He gets the glory. Amen. Was it easier or was it hard? hard. Real hard. 
Think about it, man. The greatest things you'll ever do for God are going to be in the hardest times of your life. It's going to be when you really don't want to go. And it says in verse 42, I'm taking way too long, and daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Go to Luke chapter 2. So they rejoiced after they were beaten, and they preached Christ daily. Luke chapter 21. Now I'm going to make another application from a different angle. You know, we see that that God, you know, uh, that, uh, that a good Christian man, a good Christian, you know, will live a life, if they're doing it right, full of suffering. They'll live a life full of hard work, full of endurance. That's a, that's a, that's a good word, you know, endure. Um, Luke chapter 21, verse number 4, like I said, from a different angle. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. So you got the rich people throwing in their abundance. And then this poor widow comes and she throws in two mites. And he says, She's given way more than all of them. You say, what does that got to do with it? It says, For all these have the, of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all. All the living that she had. I mean, from a, you know, look at this big picture. We're not talking about, you know, offering your money. I'm not talking about a monetary value. I'm talking about how much are you giving for God. I'm talking about, are you just giving like the bare minimum? Are you giving all that you have? Could the Lord say he gave all that he had? You know what I mean? Do you think that the Lord rejoiced in this? How come the Lord didn't stop her and say, whoa, one might? Keep your balance. Hold on to one of those. You understand what I'm saying? That's stupid. That's ridiculous. Balance. You know, the Lord rejoiced in it, man. You know, it meant something to him. It honored the Lord. He got the glory. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And then I'm going to make my final point. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this. And uh, basically everybody preached on this already, but I'm going to hit it because it's in my notes. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, the Lord made the decision. Like Brother Josh talked about, he committed it unto us. He trusted it to us. He decided, I'm going to give them the mission of reconciliation. He's not going out and doing it himself. We don't serve a Calvinistic God. He's like, I'll save him, I'll save him, not him. He gave it to you. He gave it to us. So if we don't do it, who will? Right. Nobody. Not a soul. Now, I want you to think about this. We're talking about balance here. You know, how come the Lord didn't say why? why didn't, you know, I was thinking about giving it to him, but I'm not because it's going to be real hard on him. That's not what he did. He said, I'm entrusting you with this. You know, we should take that seriously, man. We shouldn't take that. It shouldn't just be something that we kind of consider part of your balance. This is a key component of a Christian. Now, so the two points, the Christian life is full of suffering and it's full of hard work if you're doing it right. Now, I want to make a, a final statement. And I want to show just an example of what happens <clears throat> to a person who's a Christian and they kind of just get in a bad spot. Go to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 16. It's a famous passage, <clears throat> but I want to make a statement. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. I'll make this quick. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. It's about King Asa. King Asa did a lot of great things in the Bible. King Asa, you know, he did things like, you know, he kicked all the sodomites out of the land. Amen to that. You know, Man. wish more people would do stuff like that. You know, but, you know, King Asa did a lot of good things for God, man. But um, King Asa had faults also. And King Asa didn't exactly end on the highest note. And I'm going to show that. Go to 2 Chronicles 16, verse 4. It says right here, it says, And Ben-Hadad, we're not going to the whole story, we're just going to see the key points. Ben-Hadad hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. And they smote Ijon and Dan and Abel-Mayim 
and all the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Baasha heard it, that he left off building of Ramah and let his work cease. Then Asa the king took all Judah and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherewith Baasha was building, and he built therewith Geba and Mizpah. And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. So Hanani comes to Asa and he says, Hey, you're not entrusting the Lord on this. You're entrusting this with someone else, right? Would to God that every brother in Christ would not be afraid of this awkward feeling when you go to a brother and you say, hey, you're wrong. Hey, you're jacked up. Why does that have to be so weird? If you ask my oldest son, you know, if somebody came to my oldest son and said, hey, man, you're doing Halloween this year? You're going to dress up as a scary ghost and scare people? You know what he'd say without missing a beat? He'd say, no, that's probably, he'd probably say, no, that's wicked as hell. But you know what? You ever been in a, a situation like that and you kind of just didn't say that last part because it'd be awkward? You didn't want to explain yourself? Would to God if every man, you know, he, I mean, he's eight years old. Why can't we have that same approach to our brother in something that matters so much more? Hey, you're wrong. You're doing this wrong. Now, you don't have to say it like that. You can say it with love and compassion. But at the same time, man, you know, you have to take a stance. You know, pull that man out of the fire. Now, notice it says in verse 11, we're going to jump down because I'm over. And behold, the acts of Asa first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not the Lord, but to the physician. So even in this illness that Asa was going through, still didn't seek after the Lord. He sought the physicians. Now think about this. Is it wrong if you're sick to go to a physician? No. So what, I mean, what's the, what is this really talking about? You understand what I mean? I mean, it seems like there's another application here. You know, what was wrong with Asa? Well, it says, let me find out where it's at. It says in verse number... For the eye, in verse number 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. So was his heart for the Lord? Was his heart after God? You know what this shows, man? First goes your heart, like Brother Russell talked about, then go your feet. You understand what I mean? That's the application I can make. I'm not saying that's the primary application. But here's the deal. First goes your heart, and then you fall into sin. You know, first you consider this idea in your mind, and then you make the decision. I'm out. You know, so we need to have a, a biblical perspective of what the Christian balance is about. We should expect suffering, and we should, you know what, man, even when it's hard, when it's real hard, labor. Because nobody else will. Let's bow our head and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, for just the opportunity to, to preach your word, dear Lord. And I pray that... Um, that uh, you would just bless all the men here, Lord, and bless all the young children here, dear Lord, that, uh, that are listening. And pray that you would just bless this church, Lord, and help us to just grow in you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.